started on this computer. Here we go. Well, we're recording. So I'm Renelle Delmont, and I have Jamie Benvenuti and her mom, Lisa Perlman, who wrote a wonderful book that's, uh, in my opinion, the minute I saw this book, I told them it's going to send all the other books back to the Stone Age. And I, it's been since September. I have a copy and I still believe that. It's an incredible amount of uh, research that's been done. So uh, who should I ask first? Lisa, you've told us previously about your career as a judge. Do you want to yes. tell us again? And then Jamie can tell us about herself. Well, I uh, came out to California in 1971. And I had a career as a uh, litigator and appellate lawyer, and then I became a judge. Uh, I was the presiding judge of the state bar court in California that does all the attorney discipline in the state, um, appointed by the California Supreme Court. I was the first one. And since then, I, I did arbitration and mediation. And for the last uh, decade or more, I've actually spent most of my time as an author writing history books. Wonderful. Yeah. And I'm going to read them as soon as I uh, finish reading this a couple of times again. But Jamie, what have you been up to? Well, um, I uh, got my undergrad degree at Univer uh, University of Kansas um, in community health um, but uh, and development. But I also just recently got my paralegal degree last year. Um, and have uh, I'm currently working on my um, criminal justice degree because I want to be a, a, a criminal invest, uh, investigator. Um, I think it's uh, doing the research, helping my mom with the research for this book, kind of really like inspired me to say, "Hey, this this is interesting. I I enjoy doing this. I it's something I feel like I could be good at, and you know why not? You know you are so. good at it. You're a great pair." You're Thank a you. Duo, mother Amazing. And mother well, the other thing about Jamie is that she's a singer songwriter. So, um, oh, wow. that's another yeah. part of her life. A singer songwriter. What yes. kind of music? Um, uh, well, I, I like, um, I, I, I would say like in, indie folk uh, is the stuff that I write um, with kind of a jazz feel. But I like to sing all kinds of covers too. Uh, I grew up on 50s and 60s music uh, with my mom, with my parents. But I also love country. I all, I love rock and roll. I love um, blues, um, uh, American standards. Like I'm, I, I kind of love just all kinds of music. So like if I could, my my two uh, professions, if I could pick right now, would be um, professional singer or professional investigator so those are my two <laughs> I love it oh my goodness I'm married to a professional singer he's retired now but he sang all of his life in nine languages using wow. an acoustic guitar he never sang mm -hmm. with anything but a live band you know today they sing with tracks all the my husband is in a, has an entertainment agency and I was a belly dancer a professional dancer <laughs> when I was very young not uh, lately but uh, so I love show business and I love sleuthing and I've yeah. gotten involved in this just like you have but your mom has been a judge and uh, you're closer to uh, investigating uh, crimes than I ever was uh, <laughs> I've only become interested in this uh, since Olga and Ammonia wrote their book and I'm so glad that you wrote yours. So let me begin by asking you um, a question about the baby's health. The child, uh, a lot of people who see these videos don't even know what we're talking about because I, um, you know, I, I'm not, we're not explaining it from beginning to end. So I hope they pick up on the fact that a child went missing. He was found dead. Nobody could ever actually identify the child, except he was identified. Uh, there was no autopsy, but the question of his, um, of course, uh, the doctor Van Ingen wrote a letter to the grandmother saying that he had a, rick a slight rickety condition, a large square head. He couldn't get the child who he saw. I think it was two or three weeks before the child disappears. Uh, 
before Charlie went missing on March 1st, 1932, he had seen the child, he'd seen uh, Charlie, what was it, a month earlier. And he mentions, I, I don't think we've spoken about this yet, but he said he couldn't get, Charlie was spoiled and he didn't stand up. He wouldn't stand up. And I've always believed he didn't stand up because he couldn't stand up. And that indicated something else wrong. And it's a very suspicious letter that he wrote, the wording of it and everything. I Am I wrong in remembering that he told her to destroy it uh, at the beginning of the letter? The one that Van Ingen wrote to uh, Elizabeth, Mar you know, the mother, grandmother. I, but, I, think, I, I think he did. I think he, he did. He say, said destroy the letter or something like I, that. So the question did, yeah. I want to ask you, because I've, uh, because of the airplane, the you know Easter Sunday flight, she's seven months pregnant. He took her up on a trip that was so ridiculous for a pregnant woman uh, to engage in. And I've always believed, like a lot of people have, something happened during that flight in 14 hours, and the child was born with some malady because of that flight, that the flight contributed to whatever happened to Charlie. The fact that he had rickets in a millionaire family, when rickets, of course, is a, a nutritional defect that happens to children. It happened to my husband during the war. He was hidden by Christian, it's another story, but my husband had rickets as a child during the war because he had no sunshine, he had bad nutrition. That's what happens to a person when they have when they're malnourished and no sunshine. So this doesn't apply to a billionaire family's child. Uh, why did he have records? So this is a very long winded question I'm about to ask you. But friends of mine who've been looking into this for years have believed the child had epilepsy. And the reason they say this is because when you look into epilepsy of the 20s and 30s, the drug uh, given to people with that malady is phenobarbital. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. And that causes rickets. I've looked into this myself over the past decade or so. And it's true, the cure for, rick the cure for epilepsy back then, uh, one of the side effects of it is rickets. So what do you think about that with the hydrocephalus idea? That um, does that um, ruin anything? Does that help you? Does it? Uh, well, one of the, I, I hadn't heard that before. And yeah. one of the big problems with this case is that all of the pediatric records went missing. Um, so when uh, they prosecuted Houtman, um, they didn't even have Dr. Van Ingen as a witness. Uh, they did not have any of his records. What, what turned up later was the letter that he wrote uh, to Mrs. Morrow. Um, the comment he made at the time that he, was, that he arrived at the morgue several hours after the look-see autopsy, which is just a partial autopsy, right. where, he, where he said he couldn't identify him as his patient, which was quite amazing given that the last visit was February 18, which was just oh. two weeks before. It was two weeks. Uh, but the, the body was so decomposed um, and missing um, many of its organs that he was shocked by what he saw. Uh, but he did bring with him his, his pediatric records to compare because he was asked to come to identify the corpse. And so the police had those records on that day, which was May 12, um, 1932. And yet somehow or other, those records um, disappeared. Uh, so the public never got to see what his health condition uh, really was. Uh, the only um, evidence there is is that, that the doctor said that he had uh, moderate rickets, that he had uh, overlapping toes, that he had an oversized head, that his fontanelle was still not closed, right. um, an oversized chest. Um, the doctor um, had measured him, even though he wouldn't stand up straight, at about 33 inches. Uh, the corpse was 33 and a half inches, but that could happen when it's relaxed in death. So uh, 
it was the corpse was consistent with um, what he saw because the corpse also had an oversized head, but it was also missing its sex organ, so you couldn't tell whether it was male or female. Yeah. Um, and so they weren't able to use Dr. Van Ingen to identify his own patient. He never um, indicated, and he was also um, in, uh, interviewed under oath by the prosecution, and we have that record of his uh, testimony before trial. Um, there's no indication anywhere um, of hydrocephaly as a diagnosis by him or epilepsy right. or the reason why the child had rickets. What we do know is that when Anne was seven months pregnant and they flew from Los Angeles to New York uh, in an open cockpit at uh, 10,000 feet, uh, she did inhale toxic fumes. And there were other uh, aviators who had died from um, that type of experience. She was very ill when they landed. And, the, and there had, were a lot of um, reporters at the airport when they landed because Lindbergh had just set a record for flying from LA to New York, um, you know, a few hours sh uh, shorter than anybody else had done. And she was rushed off to the hospital and then back to her parents' estate, supposedly to be kept um, in bed for the next two months until her child was born. Uh, turns out that her husband lured her out on a couple of short flights, um, even just four days before the baby was born, right. one of them to Hartford, uh, mm -hmm. which was captured by a, a photographer and printed in one newspaper. In an open uh, cockpit. There were still open cockpits even no, then. No, no, yeah. I have to correct you. Wait, I didn't want to interrupt you, but Sorry. it was not an open cockpit because the oh, was serious... It? They were out in California since January. When they left mm -hmm. California, it was uh, Easter Sunday, but they'd been out there since January where they purchased that airplane. It was being built custom made for Lindbergh. And it, they innovated the open cockpit with two, uh, two glass, they're not glass, they're probably some type of plastic, or maybe it was glass. Oh. Uh, two covers. Each could be opened or closed separately. She Got describes it. Okay. it in her diary to her mother that it won't be so bad they'll be able to reach to each other because previously they couldn't even touch each other. She's sitting behind him. I've been in these planes myself. Okay. I've flown in them. You cannot hear yourself breathe in an open cockpit airplane. But she was explaining to her mother or someone in her diary, she's explaining that they'll be able to hear each other or write notes to each other. But there was a glass casing, uh, how can I explain it, covering okay. each of them separately. But how, how um, secure the, clo the closure was is another, who knows how. I don't think it could have been because she did inhale on uh, toxic fumes. Yeah. And then so, he didn't bring oxygen. He didn't bring no extra oxygen. oxygen. No. no oxygen. But I want to make another correction. Uh, Lisa, you said 10,000 feet. It was 15,000. Um, Over 10. Yeah. Okay. He even he told them when they got to Roosevelt Field that they went up 15,000 and that uh, they hit very bad. Uh, well, he says they didn't break the record and they didn't break the record because the barograph was broken. Uh, Melsky put it in his book, but I've been saving that for my book for like 10 years already. So he, he, well, he, he said he broke the record and they couldn't prove it one way or another. No, no, because... he said he didn't break the record. Oh, he did? Oh, I thought he said he did. I've okay. done research on this for years because I thought I was the only one who knew about it, but Melsky beat me to it and put it in his last book. Ah, huh, interesting. But, um, what happened, uh, in fact, I think I have it in a lecture I did. The bar graph was bolted to the Sirius because anytime you're doing an endurance uh, record or trying to break an endurance record, uh, they, the guy comes from the Bureau of Standards and puts the contraption, bolts it to the plane so that you cannot, if you put your plane down, they know about it. In other words, it's an altitude, um, mm -hmm. sort of like a seismic thing, a piece of paper with a needle that goes back and forth. And it was broken, and nobody knew it was broken. Lindbergh knew it was broken for sure, but that's probably why he told everybody at the uh, Roosevelt Field when they landed, 
oh, I didn't break the speed record. I didn't break the, he said it. The, the New York Times reported his words. They didn't break it uh, because they made a stop in Kansas. And when right. they got to Kansas, she never got out of the plane. Uh, I'm, I'm confusing everybody by talking yeah. too much. But what I want to say is the flight from California to Roosevelt Field, they made one stop in Kansas, uh, Wichita, Kansas. By that time, she never got out of the plane. They recorded her, the news reports of that event. Mrs. Uh, Lindbergh sat in the cockpit while her husband got out and refueled in 20 minutes and they never shut the engine. I went to my local airport to ask the pilots who fly these open cockpit uh, 1930s planes here in my neighborhood. And I asked them, uh, what would happen to a woman sitting in the back cockpit? Uh, they're refueling it and they didn't shut the, can you imagine filling up your car and not shutting the engine off? Would you do a thing uh, like that? I, I, I always thought the, that, that was dangerous. Right. You know, one of the things you're, I'm surprised about is that I had read that he, that Lindbergh was upset that they were that the reporters were so focused on his wife and not on his achievement. So really? I don't quite understand how uh, somebody got it wrong when they were quoting him as saying he. Um, no, no, he, had never, achieved. No. he was being honest. He knew the barograph was broken. I'm sure he knew that. Um, why the barograph broke is another question. Of course, uh, the the little paragraphs in the newspaper, this came out a week or 10 days after the flight. They did Nobody knew the barograph was broken because the Bureau of Standards had to open it up and check it to, to see what happened in the plane. That's That's the nature of endurance flying. When he went to Paris, there was a barograph in the spirit of St. Louis. How did they know he didn't put the plane down and then get to Paris? Because the barograph was still intact when he got there. It's a very important mechanical instrument that shows that the pilot stayed in the air or he landed. So he did land at Wichita, Kansas. They kept the motor running for 20 minutes. He got out of his seat and did whatever he did. His wife sat there. She sat there and they're filling up the plane. And I looked at the, I looked at the, uh, you know, the plans of the Sirius that, that they were flying in. It was a brand new plane and the fuel tank is right behind her. So I don't know how she didn't inhale fumes. She says she inhaled fumes in her diary. I think she, I guess, sorry. Yeah. Um, my question is, cause my understanding is from reading the articles, the headlines at the time, that he had beat not the nonstop record, but the transcontinental record by several hours. So if they only stopped for 20 minutes, wouldn't that still beat the speed, the, the time and record? The whole thing is totally confusing. And he, yeah. because the headlines all read, every headline, when you look at it from any newspaper, the Lindberghs broke the record, the Lindberghs broke, but he told them when he landed, I didn't break the record. And okay. what he, uh, he, his explanation when he said that is, we made a stop. Captain Hawks didn't mm -hmm. make any stop. But obviously he broke a record because they did get there three hours earlier. Exactly. So right. it may not be a non-stop record, but it would have been a right. still a transcontinental record. So right. I think that's okay. what, yeah. so he did. He did have that record, but yeah. not, but not, but not speed and not, and a, but a time record. Um, it was not nonstop. It was a time record. Well, um, if you look, a, if you look at a week later, you have to mm -hmm. really look for the word barograph. Yeah, that's how I found out about it. I, I've known uh, about this for years, and I was saving it for my book. But yeah. like so, I say, Melsky um, put it in his book, and uh, so now I'm talking about yeah. it but I was saving it anyway I'll still put it in my book yeah. but yeah, you should because I still have other things to say about it but mm -hmm. uh, the barograph um so so here's what you'll find if you do a search for barograph in the newspaper.com okay you'll find that there'll be a little paragraph just one paragraph uh, maybe two paragraphs and it'll say it'll be on page 20 page 18 mm -hmm. And it'll say, Lindy went so fast, he broke his barograph. Hmm. 
a, a headline, a little headline like that, somewhere in the back where no one's going to notice. They don't want to embarrass yeah. the guy because he'll never speak to them ever again. But yeah. that's what happened. He broke no record. He broke the barograph. The barograph. Oh, he, broke, he broke the record for getting across country. He didn't break the record for nonstop. Right. And yes. Hawks, okay. did, Hawks was the one he was trying to out, outdo. And he gave the, uh, he told the reporter, Captain Hawks is still the record breaker. I didn't break a record because I stopped in Wichita. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the thing that's interesting and why I'm making this such a big uh, to do is that something happened between Glendale and Wichita to break, to break the barograph. It broke yeah. between California and Kansas. Something happened. She was not getting out of her seat by the time they refueled. Something happened to her then. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what was I going to say? So why the barograph broke, according to the article, uh, article, it's a paragraph long, it, it reveals that the plane was some violent shape they attributed the breaking of the barograph because the bolts were coming loose what wow. in the world makes bolts come loose in a plane other than shaking and that's the way they revealed it in the newspaper the vibrations shook the barograph and so i have asked a million people that well not a million i'm, I'm yeah. exaggerating i've asked a few people what would happen to a fetus what would happen to a seven month fetus with violent shaking and nobody can tell me anything bad about that that uh, in the womb the, the fetus is protected but here's the other thing and the person who talks to me about the epilepsy that i've raised a minute ago uh he's also uh explained to me i don't know i haven't looked into it myself he's explained that even if the shaking was not enough to harm the fetus, the fact that they went up and Lindbergh gave the number, he gave the number himself, it's 15,000 feet, mm -hmm. that at that height, a fetus under conditions of lack of oxygen, lack of, first of all, it's freezing up there, even mm -hmm. with the glass cover on you, um, my friend is saying that the that hypoxia would have caused epilepsy or damage, brain damage, whatever. Well, it could have caused um, um, hydrocephaly as well. Right. That's why That's I'm a, so, it could so, have been multiple of things. Yeah. Have. And there was speculation at the time by the media that the child was either born dead or, or had some serious uh, malady. And the Lindberghs uh, showed a picture of him at one month with his mother to try to dispel that concern. Mm -hmm. But there were pictures were very few and far between. And by the time of a, a, the child was, uh, I think, 17 months, Lindbergh wouldn't permit any more pictures. There are hardly any photographs of this child. Why wouldn't you think that everybody's so... Uh, well, they were interested, but I think that uh, definitely he had an oversized head. Um, right. And uh, Lindbergh was probably uh, uh, still very sensitive to the media um, second guessing whether um, there was prenatal damage. Um, but um, all, a lot of this is speculation because it's it, of the um, because the pediatric records were never um, publicly um, disclosed. And the only thing that we know for sure, the medication he was taking um, was the biasterol, uh, which was in the diet that um, Ann Lindbergh had uh, released um, a couple days after the, uh, the abduction, which apparently is what, 50 times stronger than, than a normal dosage of vitamin D. So mm -hmm. it, if, he had, if he had rickets, if that was the condition why he was taking the biasterol, then he it's presumed he had a very strong condition of rickets to take something. I thought strong. it was more like 17 times. Was strong. it 17 times? I'm I sorry. think I, so. I know it, it many in times. Any event, 
Um, there also in Anne's diary, there's an indication that her, her son went to the doctor very often. He did? Uh, yes. Oh, I didn't know that. So there should have been lots of records. And one of the things that she was glad about um, Betty's care was that while they were gone, that Betty w was very attentive to, you know, taking him to the doctor and doing what was needed. So there, uh, I was very curious when I went to Yale to see if there were any records there. Um, and the records are gone. One of the things that I discovered though in the archives was that uh, Colonel Schwarzkopf had agreed with Breckenridge that some documents that were in the New Jersey State Police um, records from the trial um, and from the preparation for the trial uh, would be returned to Lindbergh. Um, and apparently they were and that could be among them. Um, if, if those records were there, they were never produced at the trial. They never had the doctor testify. And what happened instead was that Lindbergh and his wife um, lied on the stand about the child's health. They both um, confirmed that he was in uh, great health except for a cold. You have the, in your book, we talked about it last time, uh, Breckenridge and in his code, to Breckenridge, Schwarzkopf, and Lindbergh's uh, correspondence, or no, Breckenridge's correspondence with Lindbergh in a code that somebody cracked at Yale, mm -hmm. and revealing what you just said that the the Lindbergh baby, the child's files were no, no, the everything pertaining to the case about Lindbergh was sent to well, some him. things sensitive documents presumably that they didn't want yeah. governor hoffman and his investigators yeah. to see right. um because that's what was about to happen governor hoffman was reinvestigating the case he was getting he was not reappointing schwarzkopf and yeah. they were concerned that there were documents in schwarzkopf's file that they did not want uh, the governor to see right. and apparently those were transferred Right, and, and they did lie. As you, I never thought about it until you just mentioned it, but both Anne and Charles did not tell the truth uh, about their About his health. health. And right. not only that, they also identified the photo of, of the child from his first birthday as what he looked like when he was kidnapped. And that was the trial, that was the only picture of little Charlie at the trial and it even had a first birthday candle in the picture. Right. From right. June of 31. I know. It was it wasn't even a full it wasn't even a, a full portrait. It was a side view. It wasn't even right. a, a full frontal picture or or a, or showing how tall he was even at age one. It right. was a, it was a side view. And that's the one the where he's picture. reaching for the candle, the lit candle. Mm -hmm. He's reaching. Yeah. Um, uh, the one thing I, I don't know, you must have put it in the book, but I, I might have missed it. Not only did they give him huge doses of viosterol, which is vitamin D, but there was also a sun lamp, which is always cut out of the photograph. Whenever you see the crib, you never see the, nobody's going to notice it unless you point it out to them. The sun lamp, uh, I, obviously, Betty Gow didn't plug it in because it would have been, it would have lit up the room, would it, you know, the... Right, it wasn't, it, it was, the room was dark when she entered it on right. March 1, but, uh, and of course, he was sleeping, he'd gone to, you know, he'd gone to um, bed for two hour nap before his final um, sleep of the night, but uh, I think that was also the reason that Anne made sure to take him outside for sun, for sunshine um, during the day. Um, because of the vitamin D deficiency. Right. One more thing I need to mention because it drives me crazy. I'm not sure I'm even correct about this, but I guess I could look into it. Um, you know those safety pins that are supposed to be holding something down in the crib while the kid's sleeping? Were they not? Am I wrong? Did they put safety, pin the blanket around his neck? Or did the, the safety pins, what were they used to pin down? His they wrist? They pinned the blanket to the sheets. Wasn't it around the neck? Because oh, up, up high, but, I, but not, uh, as far as I could tell, there was no indication it was tight. It was just up high. And the yeah. idea was that he wouldn't uh, get out. I, yeah. I think there's a mention of, by Betty Gao that she was concerned and some, some statement or some notes from Betty Gao saying that she was concerned that the baby had been grabbed 
by the neck because she couldn't see how the blankets could be still be standing the way they were um, when when she entered the room if, if, if he hadn't been pulled out by the head. But here's the, I'm getting back to the epilepsy again because yeah. the guy that's been talking to me about epilepsy for years already, uh, Kurt, his name is Kurt. Uh, and uh, my, my evaluation of those safety pins, if I've got it right and I could be completely wrong, the safety pins were pinned to the blankets very high up around the neck and around the shoulders. And it's in keeping with the idea that he might have had seizures. Like, they, what is the purpose of pinning him into a blanket if not to be concerned he might have a seizure or, or some, so this is, this is for the theory of the epileptic seizure. Uh, idea, well, which could I, still be the hydrocephalus. Couldn't someone have hydrocephalus and epilepsy? <laughs> or am well, I, I don't, I'm not going to venture any medical opinion, but it, it, it occurred to me that this child was sufficiently agile that they could have pinned those um, the, the um, blankets to the sheets just to keep him from getting up and getting out and climbing out of the crib. Who, who, who does this to a kid? Who? Well, and they also it, put him to bed with thumb guards on his on but, his hand on his uh, so he wouldn't suck his thumb at night. Right. Um, there were there were strange restrictions that were imposed by his father. Um, but in any event, um, the child had over that same weekend, just before he disappeared, uh, gotten himself out of his nursery and into the bathroom all by himself. Oh. Um, and so he wasn't uh, in his crib at the time, I don't believe. I think he was just sitting on the floor playing with blocks or something. But um, he could open the door. He went to the bathroom. He was throwing all the toilet paper into the uh, toilet. Um, and nobody was watching him at that uh, particular uh, time. And, one of, and the guest, uh, Mrs. Breckenridge, went upstairs to check on him, and that's what she found. So it just occurred to me that the reason for the safety pins was to keep him from climbing out because he was, he was very large for his age. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did read recently that his, um, and I'd read it before, but I'd forgotten, his great aunt also said he was um, way oversized um, and very advanced for his age. Um, and of course, um, Mrs. Breckenridge, um, described him as looking closer to three than to two. And he was, he was 20 months. So he was very big, he was agile, he was verbal. Um, and that's a very different image than the one that they had at the trial. So what was it that he had that he would grow? Well, obviously Lindbergh saw him as growing into some kind of monstrosity that he had to, uh, what did Lindbergh fear about this child as he got older? What could he may well have feared that he was hydrocephalic, and the, and one of the reasons that um, that that is a real possibility is a new theory by Dr. Speth, who it, it, um, uh, provided an uh, declaration for my book. Uh, he just read recently. Um, a, uh, an article uh, written in 2010 about a doctor who studied under Dr. Carell, um, Dr. Uh, Harvey um, Cushing. And this is an operation done in 1908 on a hydrocephalic baby. Oh. And what Dr. Cushing did was drilled a hole in the head and put in a um, segment of a vein as a shunt. And so they were doing experimental shunts back then, but they weren't successful. And this, and this baby died afterward. It wasn't clear whether it had anything to do with that operation or just because of other complications. But this was written up um, as a um, pioneering effort by Dr. Cushing, who was a very famous neurosurgeon um, over his career. And he had learned that technique from uh, working with Dr. Carell when Dr. Carell was experimenting with operations of vivisections of dogs. 
And what Dr. Speth um, now thinks is possible, but there's no direct evidence, um, is that the half inch hole behind the child's, the, the corpse's um, right ear could have been drilled rather than a bullet, which is what Dr. Mitchell, the uh, examiner originally thought. And that could explain why there was this very round hole that looked like a bullet hole, yeah. uh, because the, that was the same size hole that was drilled by Dr. Cushing. Oh. Um, and there's no uh, and and there's no evidence that any doctor between 1908 and 1932 had perfected that technique. So if if Dr. Carell believed little Charlie to be hydrocephalic and that was why he had this oversized head, he might he might well have been tempted to perform a similar operation before he did the vivisection, which was for a different purpose. Yeah. And that would explain that hole. So that's an alternate theory. Um, and, and I did want to mention that I have um, included your, your endorsement in, um, in my book now on an opening page with several other endorsements. And in the process of doing that, I incorporated a few corrections to the text. One of them is to say that that flight when she was pregnant was not nonstop. I had mistakenly said so. It was one stop. Right. And to add this, a paragraph about Dr. Speth's new theory, which he just, um, just uh, figured out in September. Good. So that's available now, except for the Kindle edition. It's the Kindle's not quite ready yet, but the, um, uh, the paperback and the hard copy now in include those. Good. Another possibility, and um, Mom, is it okay if I talk about another possibility that we just kind of discussed earlier? Sure. Or not? Okay. Um, so... Um, most people, if, if they do, um, if they know anything about Lindbergh and his scientific research as to what motivated him to um, contact Dr. Curl in the first place, which was in the 19, uh, 1930, so the same year that his son was born, um, the same, just like five months later, like November, I want to say November of 1930, um, he went to Dr. Carell because his sister-in-law, Elizabeth, who he had um, been attracted to before Anne. Um, uh, Elizabeth had long suffered from um, heart valve problems um, and she had a weak heart because of a heart valve issue um, from I think rheumatic, rheumatic fever, yeah. rheumatic fever rheumatic as, as a child. Fever. Right. And um, so that was, if anybody knows anything about his motivation for, for going to Rockefeller in the first place, it was because he wanted to see what he could do to help Elizabeth. And one thing that I we found recently was that Carell, in, in the early 1900s, 1909, 1910, in addition to organ transplant experiments, he also uh, did experiments with um, heart valves, um, heart valve surgery. Um, and he, apparently he was like the first or among the first um, renowned uh, surgeons, experimental surgeons to uh, use a dog's carotid artery, uh, carotid artery to uh, do a, um, a bypass surgery to, to fix a heart valve um, on, um, on the animal. He was and credited with pioneering that technique. He was credited with, pi with pioneering that, bi that bypass technique. So another, so the, the experiment that was done um, that, that is in detail in the book, um, that the, the groundbreaking experiment that Carell and his team did in March and April of 1932 was specifically for a carotid artery. So if it is, you know, what we think it is, who we, if the subject was who we think it was, um, then that's another possibility as to why um, um, is because it was to benefit Elizabeth. Well, well combination. So that, I think he he he, yeah. he did consider his son a weakling. He did consider his son to have problems, and I think that it's very possible that if he thought his son was hydrocephalic, and that was the explanation for the macrocephaly because he would, clearly had an oversized head, then then at that time um, he would not the child would not have been expected to live to adulthood. Um, and so if, if Lindbergh thought that his son was doomed in any event, right. um, then he, he would think, well, this would be a better use of him to save Elizabeth's life 
Um, and, and they want to do it early on because the, they could not perfuse an adult sized organ. Uh, they could only oh, do I baby see. organs. It's very, it, uh, very tiny um, right. segments of arteries and organs uh, fit in the perfusion pump. Even though it was a good size, it had three chambers and, and it had to be surrounded by fluid. Mm. And so there wasn't, they couldn't fit um, anything large in that device. Um, the largest would be a thyroid uh, and it would be a small thyroid. Um, so uh, I think that he might have been motivated by the assumption that the child wouldn't live to adulthood anyway. Both he and Dr. Carell were um, uh, very um, devoted to eugenics. And Dr. Carell wrote a book in which he indicated, that, as he said, that weakling babies ought not to live. Right. So he probably influenced Lindbergh in that regard. And it seems pretty clear that uh, Dr. Carell was using epileptic babies um, from the uh, from institutions in New Jersey for experimentation. Right. Uh, there's one letter that uh, so indicated that there were feeble-minded prospects available to him, and all he did was experimental vivisection. Um, that that was his job. He was not even uh, licensed to practice medicine on people who were expected to survive. Um, so you put it all together, it, Lindbergh may have been motivated by knowing his son uh, had health problems, by being concerned about uh, the publicity that he might garner uh, for having potentially caused those health problems. Um, and there you go. trying to save Elizabeth's <laughs> life. And Dr. Carell was looking to experiment more to permit um, human bypass operations on the heart, uh, which, were no, which were not yet viable. Right. Well, there was no antibiotic till what, 39 and 40, and that made all those operations possible, but you just hit the nail on the head. I think it's uh, very likely that Lindbergh, from his previous behavior with that child, he would have been accused of, um, if I'm even considering that, that Anne didn't even know what was wrong with her child because he was, a, he was such a totalitarian authoritarian mentality that it's possible he never told her what was wrong with their child because it was his fault. He's the one who dragged her on that trip when doctors told her not to go. Um, there's only one report I know of where, doctor, where doctors advised her not to go on that trip and he took her anyway and she stupidly went seven months pregnant. And so if the public is going to find out eventually that their child dies at a very early age because he had something wrong with him, who are they going to look to? Lindbergh for taking his wife. Uh, so to avoid himself being blamed, eventually being outed as a, a very uh, work with a misogynistic husband. I don't know what you want to call him. And what they're going to call him in the press is not going to be very nice if that child dies at a young age from some disease. So well, I think it, you've just pointed to what it's I a, believe. It's a strong possibility as yeah. to what motivated him. I think that um, one thing that undercuts the theory about hydrocephalus uh, potentially is and I don't have medical expertise on this at all, but my understanding is that um, by the age of two, oftentimes it affects their, their mental acuity. Um, and that was not evident at all in this child. Um, mm -hmm. His great aunt considered him to be beyond his years in his vocabulary and actions. Wow. And uh, his grandmother and his mother and uh, Betty documented his, you know, skills, as did his teacher. He had a preschool teacher, Connie, I can't remember her last, Chilton, Chilton, I think it was Chilton. Smith. Chilton. Connie yeah. Chilton. Yeah. Uh, she documented uh, that he would mirror the actions of the other children um, when, he, you know, using various um, equipment they had. He was mechanically adept. Um, so, uh, and, and he had a vocabulary um, that, 
is at least what you would expect at that age. But but he did have issues. So he did he definitely had physical issues, whether or not he had hydrocephalus or not. He had noticeable issues um, okay. that were documented um, about you know the oversized head, the rickets. Um, we know he was on that that medicine um, and the and the sun lamp. So we know that there were conditions that that and that the um, and the fact that Lindbergh was reticent to let anybody take pictures of him was probably because he was ashamed of what he looked like. Well, um, aside from that, I'm not sure that he, uh, I think that he could not really walk straight. Mm -hmm. um, and so the doctors noticing that, the doctor noticing that he didn't stand up straight may have been actually physical. And one reason for thinking that is that Will Rogers visited uh, the Lindberghs a couple of weeks before the little boy disappeared. And he noticed that when uh, they were sitting in the living room, little Charlie got up to walk across the room and his father kept hitting him with a pillow and knocking him down. Um, and uh, Rogers thought that was amusing, uh, but it may have been because he didn't want Rogers to observe um, problems that the kid had um, in walking. So I don't know. Well, Ricketts but, causes bow legs, and maybe mm -hmm. he didn't walk properly because he had bow legs. We we're only guessing. But yeah. uh, I was thinking of something. No, I forgot. <laughs> there, there had to have been something wrong with Charlie for needing a sun lamp, viasterol at large yeah. doses. They're pinning him down to a mattress. Uh, he's almost two years old. He's still sleeping in a crib. And one thing we do know about Charles Lindbergh, he did not want to baby his babies. Every, he's got three living sons. Do you ever hear yeah. from them? Do you ever no. hear from Scott or Land or what, uh, John? I, I haven't reached out to them. Yeah. They never come out. They don't want to know their father. They, they probably hate him. I'm assuming they do because he probably treated them exactly like he treated well, Charlie. Well, we, and we do know what, uh, what I was going to say is um, land. Um, uh, so John, um, there's uh, references uh, from family friends who were there at, in the, at the main um, uh, vacation home with them when John was small, like two or three. And um, they were making observations about Lindbergh just throwing John into the pool to teach him how to swim when he doesn't know how to swim yet. And then you have when you know when John's eight years old, like racing him out to the or, or coaxing him to swim out to the lighthouse, and and John is like eight years old and he's right. starting starting to drown, and Lindbergh doesn't try to save him. Nope. Um, the the lighthouse guy does the the manager of the lighthouse, but um, when Lindbergh, you know, when Lindbergh was small, um, when he was like two or three, his his father did that to him too. So I think it's it's it was uh, something that that was ingrained in him from a very small age. That's what you're supposed to do um, to teach your kids to be strong. Um, but uh, it, so uh, going back to you know not you know um, babying his his kids or treating Anne you know um, with precaution when she's pregnant um, when she was eight months pregnant with Land. Um, she, um, she was on the flight back from their very dangerous um, uh, pioneering flight um, from India back to England. Um, they were on like a 10 week, she, she left England when she was six and a half months pregnant with land um, for on a 10 week trip to India and back on, on a previously uncharted, um, uncharted um, route very dangerous um, and they didn't get back to England, flying back to England until um, four weeks before Land was born. So they got back in April and he was born May 12th, 1937. I didn't know. Um, yeah, didn't. so it wasn't, so he didn't learn his lesson at all. No. Like he, it didn't, it didn't face him at all what happened to Charlie. That's um, what I'm saying, yeah. why are they coddling Charlie? That's why I'm asking this. Yeah this question of whoever wants to think about it because the idea that they had to stay another day because he had a cold oh no <laughs> I don't believe that yeah. they've, they've no. got limousines and chauffeurs and plenty of blankets and and they couldn't take him no no something it doesn't well, add there's up. another there's another part of that that doesn't add up at all and that is 
that uh, Ada Breckenridge um, later told, I, I believe Lindbergh's mother, um, at, after the body was found, um, she came to visit. And uh, Ada told her that her husband had, had told her on the weekend before little Charlie disappeared that Lindbergh had been worried about his son being kidnapped, which was a very strange thing to say that, that Ada Breckenridge never shared with the police, that Henry Breckenridge apparently never shared with the police, that Lindbergh never shared with the police, and more importantly, oh, never, never shared with Anne. And so if, if he had told Anne I'm not coming home um, Monday night, um, but stay there. Don't go to your the armed fortress of your mom's house um, because I think you might get the, you know been visited by kidnappers. I mean, she wouldn't have stayed. So what was that all about? Um, there are a lot of peculiarities, but one of the biggest gaps in the police investigation was never having Henry or his wife interrogated about what was going on the weekend before oh. of the kidnapping um, or what Lindbergh did on Monday and Tuesday in New York. They, they, they let him testify very uh, vaguely about his activities, but they could have checked phone records. They could have checked the records of Lindbergh calling. Where did he call from on Tuesday evening at, at, at uh, 7 p.m.? Where did Breckenridge call, call Lindbergh that night? Um, all of these were operator assisted telephone calls. Um, and yet um, they checked other calls, but they didn't check those. Well, a lot of things didn't get checked. A lot of things went. Well, if, who was in charge of the investigation? Lindbergh. Lindbergh was, yeah. And another uh, indication, you know, that uh, they remained till Tuesday at a isolated 400 acres. Had they been in Englewood, like you say, it was a fortress and probably the police in Englewood would have been, would have done a better job uh, than the Hopewell area police who, it, what did it they It wouldn't know? happen at Englewood. They had 29 or so staff members and, yeah. and, and a guard at the gate. Yeah. Um, this is not a place that you could pull off something like that. Right, right. That's why the whole idea that the child had a cold and he can't go back to Englewood, the whole thing is ridiculous. It's totally, it makes no sense because he never coddled a single child, never coddled uh, John or uh, Len or Scott. He treated them, uh, one of them he threw out of a helicopter in a parachute, I forgot which one it was, uh, as they were growing up. He was such a, and, and you're right, his father treated him that way, and this was a common, it's not so unusual for fathers to uh, give their children guns at the age of eight when you live out in the sticks of Minnesota. When you live in- Well, he had a gun at six, six from his grandfather and another one from his dad at seven, so. Oh, they both gave him guns? I didn't know. I know his father gave him a gun. He was six, seven, or eight. Or... Well, no, his grandfather did too, his mother's father. Oh, I didn't know that. That, that was Detroit. What did he need a gun in Detroit for? I mean, I well, can his, understand. His grandfather it. was a taxidermy, so he probably knew that he would probably enjoy it in back in Minnesota. It was probably something he expected oh. him to use in Minnesota. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but the thing about Elizabeth that you mentioned, I'm not so sure that he was in love with Elizabeth first. I'm I'm I've tried to look into that, and it's hard to know. Uh, for one thing. Anne's diaries are not trustworthy. I don't know what you think about them, but he was alive when they were being edited with Jovanovich, and I don't trust anything that's in them for the reason that Lindbergh spent his life going into everybody's archive, and of course he had access to his own, uh, and I think that he touched things up, you know? Um, I. I, well, I think that he 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 made her delete um, uh, passages, but I don't yeah. think my impression of her diary was that it was accurate to the extent of what was included. It just excluded a, right. a lot. 
Yeah, and he told her she could not write a diary for three years um, right. after they met. And she didn't uh, for a while. But well, uh, the both Anne and her mother, both Anne and her mother wrote that uh, Lindbergh seemed very enamored by Elizabeth uh, when they, uh, when he first met both daughters in uh, December of 1927. And then Anne wrote passages later on about how she assumed that he would marry Elizabeth and so did her sister Connie um, because he was, he, he was obviously attracted to her. And then when he wrote his um, autobiography of values uh, in his seventies, he recalled how taken he was with uh, her vivacity uh, when he first met her and he hardly noticed Anne, which is Anne's observation as well. So I think that that is consistent. And I think that her biographers um, all believe that as well. Uh, Elizabeth yeah, was very facile with young men and, and she had always had boyfriends and Anne was shy and more uh, scholarly. Uh, well, so he couldn't have taken Elizabeth flying with her heart condition. He no. did actually, I, I think he took her really? once or twice. Really? They took her one when they were in Mexico. That that's when they first um, when he was visiting them in Mexico. They he took the whole. He he asked Elizabeth first, and then he extended the invitation to to Anne and Connie and their mother. Um. So, um. But it wasn't. I think it was only after like he got to know the family that Anne had told him about Elizabeth's heart. Like he didn't know about Elizabeth's condition right. until later. after after till later. So I think that's probably you know. Um, that that probably had a big impact on on him deciding not to. Um, well, first of all, Elizabeth was out of the country um, when he was, you know, interested in her yeah. um, when he came back from his tour, um, and uh, and then um, and 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 I think Anne says this like in her diaries that she was his clear second choice. That um, to her, he, he she felt like she was right. his second choice. Well, when he called yeah. when she was in the, uh, at her at her parents' home, he called and asked for the uh, Mr. and Mrs. Morrow, and he asked for Elizabeth. And when right. they weren't, but then he then he said to Anne, "Oh, would you like to go for a, a ride?" Right. She had actually in uh, the spring before she had gone up and uh, with a pilot just to uh, see what it was like up near Smith, and her, she went with her sister one time, Aunt uh, Elizabeth. Oh. Um, so Elizabeth flew a couple of times. But I didn't know. I didn't know that. So she, she was well enough to go in a plane. Uh, at least on short hops. I don't know how long they were. Um, but he could never have taken Elizabeth to South America. No, she would, she would never have been enough to fly across country. Her really. health wasn't good enough for for um, uh, for that, and and it was very clear to him after um, starting to date Anne because Elizabeth had um, suffered a setback, I think, with pneumonia um, when she was in Europe and had to come back and convalesce. So it there there was that um, family information that he uh, obtained. But he had also decided by then that he wanted to have, have 12 kids before he even started dating Anne. And before he even met, met I think, the Breckenridge, I'm sorry, not the Breckenridge family, the, um, the Morrow family, I think he'd already decided he wanted to have 12 kids. And so when he, and it, he talks about, you think it's like in um, Autobiography of Values or some other, some other book, um, biography, where he talks about finding a mate um, instead of finding, you know, finding a wife, finding, finding, you know, um, was, what was it that Eric Berg, I'm sorry, not Eric Berg, um, Scott Berg, Berg says about that he, that he, uh, that he went about choosing a wife the way a farmer would go about choosing a cow. I mean, that's how, that's how he saw, right. um, choosing a, like, uh, you know, a life partner, um, uh, was about, us passing on good genes. That's that's all he considered. You eugenics, know, when, eugenics, yeah, eugenics. the mentality. Yeah. Well, amazing. he won an award. He was given an award after his flight for being the a kind of Nordic example of superior eugenics. <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't know about that award. He he was given an award by. Uh, well, he, we we Minnesota. don't know if he actually received it. We know that that he was that the that the president of the Minnesota Eugenics Society, uh, um, I've, Charles Dite, 
uh, I want to say he he was he was a big eugenics guy. He was the president of the Society of Minnesota um, at the time. And there's a letter uh, that's referenced in the Minnesota archives that said that um, that that um, from Dite to Lindbergh um, saying that he was being honored with this award for, you know, being superior example. We don't, there's no proof that, that uh, Lindbergh ever physically accepted any award, but there's a letter mm -hmm. saying that he, that he was the recipient of an yeah, award. Well, they gave, so, everybody gave him awards. Yeah. All over the world, they, they granted but him. Most of them he didn't ever keep. He put them in a museum right. in St. Louis. Right. They're all in the basement now. I think they took them off the, uh, well, they, they took the medal from Goering Hitler, uh, put it in the basement. I think it's not on exhibit anymore. At the Sa I never got to St. Louis. Did you go there? Or you just had people researching from it? Because it's a great place to do research. The Minnesota they, they, Historical Society. I, I've, I've gone to the Minnesota Historical Society in St. Paul, Minnesota. You did? Not, yeah, that's where it is. Right. Um, and I've been there on a couple of occasions. Because originally he packed everything and sent it to them. Yale came later. But when right. he was getting all these awards, when he flew to Paris in, tw in the late in 27 and afterward, he thought he was going to live in St. Louis. In fact, on the birth certificate, it says that he's St. If you notice Charlie's birth certificate, it gives their address as St. Louis, not Englewood. Oh, OK. But I didn't yet, know. I didn't, I didn't. I don't well, think Charlie, I, I, Charlie doesn't even have a name until July. He's born yeah. June 22nd, the first, second, second week of July, he gets a name. His birth certificate is blank where the name is. And the resident of the mother is St. Louis and the resident of the father is St. Louis. They were going to live there. For wow. uh, Lindbergh liked St. Louis. He didn't like the East Coast. He didn't like cities. He didn't like big cities. Um, well, he didn't like living under his in-laws roof either. No. <laughs> well, the, um, yeah. I don't know what he liked. Who knows? I mean, I, I can't believe anything the guy wrote or, or said. I'm so skeptical of everything because he was a practical joker and he hated the press. And this was a big hoax that he committed. Uh, the press bought it, we bought it, the whole world bought it, and look at us now, 88 years later, we're asking what happened. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, yeah, well, so I think I know what happened. It seems um, that everything I researched led in one direction. Well, but you, you have didn't to know that you were going to come along with something called a computer <laughs> in something called cyberspace. Why would they think they didn't? Uh, he probably thought this is safe. It's hidden. Who's going to know? Right? Yeah. Well, they caused an immense amount of confusion. And it was deliberate from day one, including the height of the baby, whether he had curly hair, um, you know, just all, all kinds of confusion. I mean, I didn't uh, realize right away that in addition to giving the New York Times a photo of the child at one year and pretending that it was only two weeks old, Lindbergh actually released nationwide at four newsreels uh, the uh, home movies that were taken at his grandparents' house in Englewood on the first birthday. So they had moving pictures in movie theaters across the country, supposedly of what this little boy looked like. And I actually think that um, the reason that uh, those photos came into the newspapers that were um, uh, several newspapers that said, this is what Charlie really looked like when he was um, uh, kidnapped was because of impetus from Anne. My guess is that she was really unhappy with the phone calls that kept getting referred to her about these little one-year-olds with curly hair that people thought might be her son. Ooh. And she was answering a lot of those calls. And within a week, Colonel Schwarzkopf goes public and say, well, actually he had his hair cut before um, he disappeared. And, and around that same time is when these photos came out, which I think his grandmother took at the time of the haircut, which is what I did when my grandson got his first haircut. Before or his analytic pictures. 
Um, and, and Lindbergh was prohibiting the press from taking pictures, but he couldn't stop the grandmother in her own bedroom from right. taking a photo of, of, of her grandson. So and the, that's what we had, that's what we had uh, last year. I was able to get a forensic artist to, to analyze and say, yes, if you look at the photos that are on the poster of the child at one year, and you look at the ones that are on the uh, history channel uh, of the child around one year, similar photos taken around the same time. If you age that child, which is what is done for um, missing children, um, uh, eight, eight months, months, then he would look like the photos that were in the newspaper of a, of a kid who looked much closer to three than to one. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah they have um, that ability now. I don't, they didn't do it back in the 20s or 30s, but today no. they have the ability to advance like Eitan Pates, the child that went mm -hmm. missing in my neighborhood long ago. They've periodically put for, uh, drawings of what he might look like today at the age of 45, you know. So yeah. that's what they were doing. Uh, well, I asked an, a forensic artist to look at that and, and she said that comparing the photos that were in the newspaper and one of them said, this is what he looked like when he was kidnapped. That, um, the one the, that was the caption to the photo and it, it was it, the same photo in several papers. Oh. Um, and she said the hairline, um, and, 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 the, and the nature of the hair, I think, and the forehead, it looked to her like the same child further developed eight months, especially knowing that he had an oversized head, <clears throat> you know, that he had grown bigger than you would expect most children to do in that eight month period. And, and mm -hmm. as, 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 um, as realistic as those pictures are, I think it would be very uh, unlikely that that in the in the 1932 that newspapers had access to any kind of technology that could that could that could um, give an accurate depiction a photorealistic accurate depiction of what an eight month old or what a 12 month old will look like eight months later mm -hmm. um but so the other to me that's yeah to me i mean because we're talking about 88 years ago we where we have that we, we have that technology now Right. But I think one of the, the things that lends credibility to those being actual actual photographs um, of what the kid looked like, not instead of just drawings, but actual photographs. And again, I'm not I'm not a forensic uh, photographer or f forensic artist, but to me, as realistic as those pictures are of a real child, um, <coughs> and the fact that the forensic artist said this is what I would have expected uh, Charlie to look like at 20 well, months. There's three other reasons for, for reinforcing that. Um, one of them is that no one came forward to say, no, that's, those are false. That's not what he looked like. And it was in several papers. Another reason is just the fact that it was published at all. If, if, if several papers published those pictures and said, this is what he looked like when he was kidnapped. It was because they credited the pic the source of those pictures as being legit. Well, who could give them pictures of this child that they considered legit? Certainly not a, a, a newspaper photographer because they didn't have access and mm -hmm. they hadn't had access for many months. His grandmother, on the other hand, who was a very rich, powerful woman, if she said, here are the pictures of my grandson, they would accept that. And who else would have the power to get those published in opposition to Lindbergh himself saying, here's what he looked like to the New York Times and here's what he looked like in the newsreels, which, was, which were taken eight months earlier. So to me, it reinforces that the grandmother um, probably gave him to the newspaper, but there's another thing that's very strange. And that is we found out, I found out recently that the New Jersey State Police Museum does not have any of those photos from the newspaper and never did. So Mark Falzini, the archivist had never seen them, which to me is very bizarre for what reason? Because even if they were questioned as not being really what he looked like, they should have been investigated right. by the largest investigation in the country's history and they should have seen them because they were in several papers. And in fact, they were mentioned in Laura Vitre's book that came out 
in mm -hmm. April of 32 and saying, I don't understand why these photos aren't being replicated everywhere. What, what's going on? Why is it that these, these later photos aren't the ones that they're using to get people to search for this child? And so it had to be deliberate that those right. photos weren't included. Maybe they were originally, and maybe they were returned to Lindbergh um, as part of what went back to him in 36. But the fact that they're not to be found among 90,000 um, documents in the New Jersey State Police Museum right. is, a, is very questionable. Suspicious, yes. Yeah. The other thing about that is that um, those pictures indicate, because there's a picture, of uh, the kid with short hair. So whoever took, whoever submitted those pictures to the paper um, had knowledge or at least um, either direct knowledge or access to direct knowledge that the kid had had his hair cut. Um, and, uh, and which was confirmed by Schwarzkopf. So um, the fact that Schwarzkopf confirmed that the kid had his hair cut when nobody had reason to suspect otherwise because the, the the um Schwarzkopf all the did that two days after they appeared in the newspapers. Yeah, he didn't confirm photos. it until after the until after reporters were asking him about it because they had seen the pictures in the paper. So these these pictures are released in several papers starting, I think, March 9, March 8 or March 9, 1932, saying this is what the kid looked like at the time he disappeared. Um, both with um with long curly hair, older looking kid uh, with the very uh unique curly hair pattern, which, which if you look at, at Charlie, he has a very distinct um, hairline, which is something that the forensic artist mentioned, is that he has a very unusual, distinct I, hair. Yeah, I've wondered about yeah. that because it doesn't look normal. I mean, I've seen no. a lot of babies and young kids, as we all have, and there's something wrong with his hair. It looks almost like yeah. a real, it doesn't even yeah. look like real hair to me, but it may be the photography okay. of the day. What that, that's that that is, that's true, but there there was something distinct about it that yeah. that, that that led to the forensic artist who looked at it last year just to, to posit that it was the same that it was likely the same kid because of the hairline, um, but um, but the fact that Schwarzkopf confirmed that the kid had his haircut, which is what the article said. Nothing in the article, and it's called "Eaglet May Be Disguised," is is the article. Anybody who wants to look on newspapers.com. That's that's what the article is called. Eaglet, and it was a second, say it again. The, the eaglet may be disguised, or eaglet may be disguised uh -huh. is is the title of the article, and it's basically just like um, the pictures uh, of uh, pre haircut, post haircut, and a caption saying this is what Charlie looked like at the time he disappeared, and this is what he may look like if if the um, if the uh, if the kidnappers had decided to cut his hair. Um, Cause they didn't say specifically in the, in the article that he had, had had his hair cut, but they said, this is what he would look like if he had his hair cut, but it looks to be an actual photograph of the haircut. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, people can look at that if they got newspapers.com subscription, it was in like 10 papers um, within the first, uh, between March 8 and like March 11, like several papers had published that same article. There was no source uh, printed um, no, um, uh, no, uh, no byline. So it doesn't say who wrote the article and it doesn't say um, the source of the photos, right. but the same article, the same caption with the same pictures appeared in multiple papers, not just one paper, but multiple. Um, and the fact that none of the family, there's, there's no records that we found publicly in the papers. And I've been looking to see if the family, if Lindbergh, if Anne, if Mrs. Morrow, if anybody who was close to the child, to close to Charlie, disputing that article. And that was those, that article and those pictures were what prompt, or likely what prompted the reporters to ask Schwarzkopf if the kid had had his hair cut. Yeah. Cause well, there's another um, indication from Anne in her diary. I'm sorry. Yeah. Are you done? Um, uh, and that is that she really was upset about the pictures of her son at age one. Uh, which were appearing everywhere um, because they were making her forget what he really looked like. Oh yeah, you said that, yes. So yeah. he and so, 
so that's reinforcing that he, he looked substantially older. You've got uh, Ada Breckenridge describing all his activity, running around with the dog and, um, you know, getting in and out of the room by himself and um, having a vocabulary. All of that is not the image you have of this little child that they um, imprinted in people's minds. So, which made it a lot easier to convict someone of kidnapping him out the window because uh, a 33 inch kid who looked, who was, you know, oversized for his age um, and hefty um, being taken out a, a narrow window and down a rickety ladder, um, the jury couldn't have imagined it anywhere near as easily as that burlap bag and a tiny little kid, right. uh, which is the image that they were sold. Right. Well, because, yeah, the burlap bag itself, I think, was only 36 inches tall. So if you think about it, if, if you had put a 33 or 33 and a half inch child in that burlap bag, how the heck are you going to carry it. that with one hand? You know, like how, how do you carry without it breaking, first of all? But like th that, I mean, th that's just like if they had actually, you know, if it had been a 33 and a half inch kid or a 33 inch child in a 36 inch bag, um, how, how was that possible? And I just, well, I think, it, the, the, yeah. The police figured it out. They, they actually carried away, they had somebody, they built a replica ladder. They actually tried the first ladder, the actual ladder um, and did both. And they, and they figured out that if a fellow uh, tried to, um, go up to the window and come back down with a 27 pound weight. He dropped the weight every time and okay. fell essentially because they couldn't do it. And that okay. the ladder could not hold more than 125 pounds without cracking. Um, so when you talk about 160 to 180 pound man plus 27 pounds of kid, um, you're talking close to you know 200 pounds or more, um, that ladder couldn't have held it. Um, and if he'd had competent, if Houtman had competent counsel, they might have tried to have a reenactment with that ladder and it would break um, yeah. because it couldn't have, it, you could not replicate what uh, uh, was being told by the prosecutor to the jury actually happened. The other and part of that, of course, was that the burlap bag uh, never held a live child who was bleeding to death. No. Um, they had no blood. The squib, there was no blood. The squib report, which was not introduced at the Houtman trial, um, that but, uh, did analyze the burlap bag, there was no blood. Right. Um, well, the, the <laughs> other thing that I think um, that in, in um, Governor Hoffman's article, I think from 1937 or 1938, um, that was, I think, after his investigation or during his investigation, he says that there was no evidence of, um, of anything falling in the mud. There's evidence of the broken ladder, but there's no evidence at all of anything falling in the mud below the window anywhere. I mean, they had the footprint, but they had no indication of anything of any size, let, it be a, let alone a 27 pound kid. But there's, there's no evidence of any, um, of any impression in the wet mud. Anywhere. But the, the, ladder, the ladder itself was not deep. The, pr the right. imprint of the ladder rung was not deep enough to have accounted for a heavy person. Right. Oscar Bush it. noticed that right away and right. he thought that the ladder was a ruse. Right. But uh, to, to Jamie's point, uh, there also was a footprint there that was bigger than Houtman's footprint, and that uh, that got destroyed before trial. So that it was they, they took a pic. Well, but they did take a picture of it. And one thing okay. that that I'm that I'm surprised that they did was the person who did take. So this is one of those things that they gave more away than they probably should have if they were trying to hide it. Um, the New Jersey State Police is I think it was Bornman or Degatno or one of one of the first responding New Jersey State Police officers who actually measured that footprint that they have a picture of that they that they submitted at trial as evidence. Um, they they got a prox approximate measurements of that footprint and they and and the officer testified to it. Um, when I say approximate, it's because he said even though they had a ruler uh, or had, had access to a ruler. They used 
the flashlight um, to oh, yeah. um, to measure the length to measure the length of the footprint, and they used he uses the palm of his hand yeah. to measure the width, and so he got approximate measurements. But with the approximate measurements, what he said, I think he said that the that the length of the foot of the footprint was about eleven and a half inches long, or or something close to that, and then um, the width was about four and a quarter inches wide. Um, and it's what is Clark's feet that doesn't fit how yeah the... exactly and and so what what we found though is that those measurements again they're being approximate because they didn't use a ruler um, um, are are very very similar to the measurements of the rubber shoe that was um, shoe. that was analyzed by uh, Squib in the Squib report mm -hmm. um, and the research that I did um, because they measured. Um, to me, like inch, inches long doesn't mean anything to me when you're talking about shoes. I know shoes based on shoe sizes, you know? So I was like, okay, they said that the, that the shoe in the squib report was about 11, three quarter inches long or something. Cause they measured that. They measured that with, um, with actual measuring devices. But, um, so I was like, okay, well, how, how long would this be in, um, in shoe sizes? And uh, we, I found that based on uh, research on um, finding, um, converting, you know, uh, I went to a, sh a shoe store who that, that publishes their conversions um, uh, for shoe size based on how long your foot is. And um, the, I think I found that based on the measurements that Squib reported and the approximated measurements of that the New Jersey State Police testified to about that one footprint in, in the mud, um, I think they said it was between 11 and uh, um, the conversion is about between 11 and 12 and a half. A, ma a male, male shoe size between mm -hmm. 11 and 12 and a half. I think and, um, yeah. Size, right? Yeah. Lindbergh Lindber wore a size 11 D and, and that information um, was um, because he donated his boots to a museum and oh. they and they recorded the measurements. <laughs> so that's that's how I thought that that's the only way I knew was because well, Oscar, he Bush also, Oscar Bush also noted that the uh, print under the a nursery window uh, appeared to be someone wearing golf socks over their shoes. Um, and of course, the uh, Maros and Lindbergh played golf. Um, this was not something that uh, a poorer person or a city fellow who had nothing to do with the sport would have uh, normally carried around with them. Yeah. But the other thing is that Lindbergh uh, was reported in, in time when he was, you know, when he got that the big time of, times man of the year, the first time man of the year, they, they, they talked about how unusually large his feet were, yeah. um, about how they didn't have shoes big enough to fit him. Right. when he landed in Paris. So for, so the shoe size to me is, is very important because mm -hmm. I mean, size 11 now may not be that big for a man, but back then it was. Right. And especially when you're talking about a rural community where there aren't that many people living there who, who would have, you know, that, um, that, that large a foot. And we, then the person that we know who did have that large of a foot was the father well it should isn't have been just the the footprint in the mud it's look at the rungs of the ladder how far yeah. apart they are yeah uh, someone of Hauptmann's size would not have been comfortable making a ladder with rungs that far apart and climbing such well a no part. they're 21 inches apart and one of the things about that is that's partly what made it so rickety so yeah. someone who was taller could could, could um, use a ladder with, with steps that far apart, but it would be much stronger ladder if it had more frequent rungs. That's and true. so someone like Hauptmann would have known that and there would be no incentive for him to make a ladder that was awkward to climb uh, for himself as well as less stable. Right, right. I, it's true. I didn't think of it that way. The, the ladder is very disturbing because people like I've invited Kelvin he's he's doing something with his research he'll be um, on zoom with me eventually 
uh, you know about Kelvin Correga's analysis yes. that the wood in the, the uh, rail uh, 226, I get the numbers all mixed up, but that yes. the attic floorboard matches the ladder. Now, um, I, I don't agree that I don't agree either. But uh, speaking of the ladder, I just want to mention something that before you came to talk to me, I was looking through your book again, and I was I missed out on the knowledge that you have um, reported there that Mark Falzini discovered that Halpman never used the ladder to go into the mayor's house. I didn't even know that myself. I just read it an hour or so ago. Uh, Mark found this out. I'll yes, he did. And, uh, and he actually went back uh, and did two things. He went back to look at the trial record to see if there was any mention by Willens of uh, this supposed use of a, uh, of a ladder in a robbery by Houtman before, because it would have been modus operandi. You know, mm -hmm. this is his method of, of doing these kind of um, home invasions. And there was no such rep, uh, reference. Now, the German record was delivered to the New Jersey police in November of 1934. It was in German and it was translated into English. I have the English version. It's very detailed about each of his burglaries, exactly what he used. He had a crowbar. He went in on the first floor. But what uh, Mark did is he went further and he, he got the German original document and he got a German dictionary and he looked to see if there was ever a word ladder in German that didn't get translated. And that was, it, it wasn't. And what he, what, what Falsini, Mark Falsini figured out was that the very first reference to the use of a ladder by Hauptmann uh, was in a 1961 book called Kidnapped. Um, oh. And that, it, and apparently it was made up in that um, <gasps> book, and it was used ever since. As that was gospel. the Waller book, W A L L E R, right. and he inserted the word ladder when it didn't exist in the report. He. That's apparent. That's what Mark Felsini concluded, and that's what he told me. Unbelievable! Wow. I just discovered it a few minutes before you came to talk to me. So what else have we not uh, figured out yet? That's, I mean, it's, in, uh, wow, that, that blew me away because I believed, and probably it's on my website, that Hauptmann had entered the Burgermeister's uh, home on the second floor, an invasion with a ladder, and none of it is First true. floor, the desk in the living room, and he made the mistake of taking the mayor's watch. Uh, so it was pretty obvious where he got it from. Um, and you know, oh. he was um, impoverished, he was starving. Uh, the Germans had lost the war and weren't paying their soldiers anything. And all, I think all of his burglaries occurred uh, within a week that he originally got arrested for. Oh. And then after he was released on parole, I believe he was arrested again for selling a um, conveyor belt that was stolen from a factory. And it was unclear whether he was just fencing it for a friend or whether he had participated. Um, but that was the other incident that happened later uh, before he um, stowed away and, and came to the United States. So he didn't uh, flee from prison? He didn't break out of prison? He didn't break out of prison. He uh, violated the terms of his parole. Oh, well, I'm going to have to revise my web page on Hauptmann's, uh, but I don't believe that the attic floorboard uh, relates it, to. At the, least uh, my, my recollection is that he did not, I, I don't know whether he was in uh, custody at the time, but it wasn't a prison breakout. Um, oh. However, he was able to, to uh, uh, sneak away. Um, it, it wasn't a, a violent breakout of any kind. Right. Yeah. So uh, Willens didn't uh, use the, the latter story. No, not at all. It didn't exist then. That's what Mark Calzini found, that, that, that nobody ever heard of it uh, for another 30 years because Waller's book didn't come out until 61, I think. Right. Six, early 60s. Yeah. It's, uh, wow, really, yeah. 
remarkable. And none of those people expected us to be here 88 years later. Well, I think that, you know, that it was such a big deal at the time and they wanted to put it behind them. So after, you know, Governor Hoffman's investigation, um, New Jersey and, you know, Governor Hoffman wasn't reelected um, after that investigation. He, he kind of, you know, he, he said a, a kiss to his political career goodbye. Um, and he, I think he knew that when he, when he did the investigation. Um, I don't think uh, New Jersey officials ever, or the Lindberghs or anybody ever expected that these records would ever become public. Right. So that because wasn't I don't, until 1981 and, and the governor decided to make them public. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because Anna couldn't get anywhere with the Supreme Court. David Wilentz's son was the head of the Supreme Court at the time. And since, Lisa, you are a judge, retired judge, can you speak about that? Um, do you, um, I mean, I, I think it's crooked to begin with that she didn't get to, but what do I know? I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a paralegal, but he was the head of the Supreme Court when she brought her lawsuit. Well, uh, that the question is whether he should have recused himself from that. I think he did, um, didn't he? Didn't I he? don't know whether he did or didn't. Um, yeah. But well, uh, but I will say that that um, the trial judge who was uh, uh, sitting by assignment in the Hauptman case, uh, Justice uh, Trench. Um, did recuse himself from the appeal because he went back to sit on the Supreme Court when, when Hauptman's case came up on appeal as to whether or not oh. um, they should reverse the, the, um, Decision. the conviction. And uh, he did recuse himself, but it was still very awkward because he was a, he was a long-term member of that same court. And so the, his brethren, because there weren't any women on the court at the time, right. were not about to, to reverse right. um, the, the decision in such a famous um, trial where everybody, in terms of the public reaction, wanted the case over with and behind them. And, uh, and there was so much pressure, except from Governor um, Hoffman, um, to let him be executed. Right. But later, when Anna brought, when Brian, her lawyer, Robert Brian, he's out in San Francisco. Uh, did you interview? You didn't. I tried to. Um, I'm not sure where he is right now. I actually uh, called him a few times and left messages. I went he to his. Answer. Uh, he doesn't, doesn't answer. answer. I'm not sure if he's actually in residence there now. I don't know, but I he never responded. San Francisco. Well, whatever. He was up against uh, Robert Wilentz. I mean, how, and even if Robert Wilentz recused himself, the other eight jurors, uh, the other eight uh, judges were not going to go up again. Wilentz was in his 90s. He was alive. She brought the lawsuit against Bornman, Bornman uh, Louis Bornman, who was the one who created the attic uh, business with the floorboard. Uh, the lawsuit was against Bornman. Uh, Wilentz and the state of New Jersey. And Robert Wilentz was the head of the court. So I don't know how they expected to get any satisfaction. It was really based on Anthony Scaduto's, uh, you know, scapegoat, the, yeah. the book that he. Uh, and yeah. even, you know, everything came out piecemeal. I think Michael Melsky has unveiled a lot of material that nobody else ever yeah. uh, had found. Uh, and before that, the FBI finally, under the Freedom of Information Act, released confidential documents in 2003 that are not even included in the book called Top Secret that's supposed to be the confidential FBI files. And so uh, there's layer upon layer of obfuscation that um, has impeded research over the years. That's right. And while Hoover was alive, after, like you say in your book, I think I read it in your book, in this book, or maybe you commented in another one of your books that when Hoover died, they raced, uh, well, T Tolson got all the documents. His boy well, immediately the FBI raced over to the house to get them yeah. because 
they were very damaging to a lot of famous people. That's right. And then Tolson dies, I think, a year or two later. And and uh, right, that was that was when they did that. They they grabbed those documents. Um, yeah, it was uh, something that uh, he was using for blackmail, essentially. Right. Um, I think I know this sounds crazy. I can't help. My suspicion is very deep, and I'm very um, uh, skeptical about uh, law enforcement agencies. And the, oh, okay, well, I think they're still at it. That it's represented by, in my opinion, these people who write books that are blurbed by law enforcement agents, like uh, the one about. Bruno, they never called him Bruno, but somebody wrote a book. Dan Quayle has a blurb on the back of that book. Do you know what I'm, I'm getting at? I don't, know that, yeah, I don't know that book, but I think that uh, Fench's book is, Thomas Fench's book is um, very misleading. And Jim um, Fisher, look at Jim, Jim Fisher. Fisher's That's book is very misleading as well. There's so much material that one of the things that, that Fisher does that Fench didn't is he, he actually goes into a lot of sources like Van Ingen's uh, dispute of whether uh, he could identify the child and all. Mm -hmm. He puts it in there, but he puts it in, in a very weird way from my perspective, which is that the, in the text, um, he says that Dr. Van Ingen identified the a corpse. In a footnote, which most people don't bother to read, he says, well, actually, Dr. Van Ingen disputed that. Well, if Dr. Van Ingen disputed that, you shouldn't be putting that in the text. You should say it's disputed and why it's disputed. But he would resolve any disputes in favor of the state police version and then put the opposite in a, buried in a footnote. Um, I, and I found that odd, but I also found it really odd that he introduced his book by saying um, that he made several assumptions, all of which undermine the validity of his conclusions. I mean, to assume, to assume that the uh, investigation by the state police was totally thorough when you know that they stopped looking for major things like the person who drove a car with a ladder in the back uh, over the uh, passenger seat at the foot of the Lindbergh's driveway two hours before um, the, the uh, kidnapping could have taken place. Um, they could have checked every, every person who owned a 1929 dark blue or black Dodge um, it, that um, they could have done that easily. And, and halfway through that list, they quit. And here they had a witness who said, that's what I saw, it had local plates it was a 1929 uh, Dodge, and it had a ladder in the back with uh, hanging. Just look, and it looks very much like the ladder you just showed me in the yard that they say was used in the kidnapping. That is bizarre that they didn't investigate that. I also just recently realized that the neighbors who saw a car in Featherbed Lane around 6:30 that night, which is right parallel to the Lindbergh house, um, the Conleys. We're not interviewed for a year on, uh, uh, after, so that their memories would be vague. <laughs> How many people lived in, uh, around Lindbergh? Hardly any. Very people. few. Very few, and yet, and and also, Laura Vitre said, "I thought it was very remarkable to read her book and the um, other book that were written by reporters." in April of 32, because it was very fresh and they were covering this as the biggest story of their time. But it was and also before the baby's body was found. So that was they before did, the baby's they body was, was found. Yeah. But one thing they noticed was that when the reporters went around to talk to the neighbors, uh, instead of the thorough um, investigation that the police had reported that they had done, they found that the most of them hadn't been talked to or talked to at length. Um, so they were undermining the police version of how thorough they were in real time. Could that have been Lindbergh uh, giving them orders? No. Absolutely. Oh, uh, it was. He could the control to stop looking. To, to right. yeah. In fact, um, you know, it's interesting to see what what uh, Walsh said because apparently he told um, uh, Curtis. 
um, that they that they did better investigative work when Lindbergh wasn't around than they did when he was around. So uh, Walsh is an interesting character because I think he committed perjury at the trial. Um, he came forward and, and pretended um, that he made the hole in the skull of the um, right. corpse when Walsh he couldn't have done so. When Mitchell said that's not even possible, it's the hardest part of the skull, it's thick, and you can't do that with a stick. Um, I think it wouldn't have been round and it wouldn't have been as round as it was. But uh, he was also the second person that the police said did it because they tried to get Keaton uh, to say that he did it. And that's what they told the, the Bronx grand jury is that Keaton poked that hole and then Keaton wouldn't come forward and say that. And mm -hmm. so two months later, they got Walsh to say it instead. Okay. Well, Keaton and Walsh, well, Keaton was, I think, a New Jersey State Police officer and Walsh was on assignment, right? right. He, he was a detective from Jersey City. Um, uh, so they were both involved in the New Jersey State Police investigation officially. Um, right. And Mitchell Mitchell was the um, was the uh, medical, medical examiner, medical examiner oh. who, who did the pre autopsy on the um, on the body before it was cremated. Right. So I think you, when you talk about these people, you might want to explain who they are. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. But the point I was making is that Walsh you, you, he was very instrumental in the investigation. He was brought in from Jersey City. He was pretty high up um, in terms of his role in the investigation. And sometimes he seemed to want to investigate and sometimes he seemed to want to be part of the cover up. So uh, it was a, 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 an odd fellow. I, I do remember reading that Jay Hoover was really happy when Walsh left the investigation in about August of 32. And he wrote, uh, Hoover wrote a note on one of the memos that he got um, saying, uh, that's the best thing that's happened so far uh, to this investigation that Walsh is no longer part of it. Um, there's some very strange goings on in that investigation. Right, right. it is. It's, and a lot of it makes no sense. and. I don't know another case that is this uh, crazy. It's almost like Mr. Magoo wrote the script. It's, uh, it's- Well, the only thing that makes sense, the only thing to me that makes sense is that it was a hoax and it was a big cover up because of, of the players involved and because of how powerful Lindbergh was. Because if you think about it from any logical standpoint, there's nothing logical about this unless you think, unless you consider that, you know, um, that, that, that they ran this investigation, that they were this inept on purpose. Right. And actually Melsky uh, found, um, I'm probably from his grandfather, I don't know, um, that um, Walsh um, later said that some of the officers who were involved in the investigation suspected Lindbergh of a role, and but he uh, didn't do anything about it because he was just too big to bring down. Right. Well, they were terrified. I've, I've seen, uh, I don't even remember where I see anything anymore. I, I, I'm being drowned by all my research. I don't know what happened to you, but I feel like I'm being <laughs> In and not in and drowned by so yeah. much 20 years of stuff. I don't know where to find it, but I know I read it somewhere. Yeah. And Lindbergh got very large when he was angry. And that, that was something that I've been looking for. Uh, never seemed to find anybody pointing to Lindbergh in a negative way. They were terrified to comment about his, uh, well, they talked about his practical jokes for as long as he's, since 1927, Lindbergh is known as a practical joker, even though they're describing sociopathic, psychopathic behavior with these jokes, but that was okay in the newspapers. What was not okay, evidently, because I don't find any of it, is depicting Lindbergh as, it's not until he gets into the Nazi era that they begin, that Dorothy Thompson and Walter Winchell start doing that to him. But before that, when it pertains to this case, there's nowhere except Michael's book where he found the he found well, there the is information that you're talking about, but nowhere does anybody describe Lindbergh as a nasty, uh, angry, threatening 
but he did do this. He did. Well, there are a couple of places where they where where they do. Uh, in Scaduto's book, he refers to a quote from Adela St. John's, uh, the reporter, um, mm -hmm. who said that uh, Lindbergh threatened to kill. Um, he said, Robert, "Where is that sca scapegoat?" In Scaduto? Anthony Scaduto's book, he wow. quotes Adela St. John's as saying that Lindbergh threatened to kill anybody who disobeyed his orders um, oh. and, and investigated on their own. Um, oh, that's what Algren and Monia say in their book. And I wondered where they got that. Because Scaduto's have... book mentions Adela St. John saying that, but she heard it from another reporter. Oh. I don't think it was said to her directly. Um, so there is a little bit like that. There's also a quote in Scott Berg's book of Betty Gao, who he met years later, um, and she said that there was a that Lindbergh had a sadistic streak. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, she wasn't going to say that during his lifetime. Right. Um, but uh, the, the references are few and far between. There's mm -hmm. also. There's also that um, that report that was done um, for Governor Hoffman in 1938 that was confidential until you know the um, New Jersey State Police files were released to the public. But in Governor Hoffman's investigation, he interviewed um, the former colleague partner of um, Frank Kelly, who was the fingerprint man um, on the scene um, that night. Right. Right. And. And um, they quoted, um, and when they did the interrogation of his, uh, his former partner, um, the former partner uh, quotes Frank, Ke Frank Kelly as saying, um, what does he say about, um, that he overheard a conversation between um, Lindbergh and uh, Betty Gow that right. night, saying mm -hmm. that uh, with Lindbergh telling her something about You'll be sorry if you say something to the police. Yeah, or, I, I forget that. exactly what the quote is. I but, think that's um, in Nelsky's book, but it's I, in I, 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 I book. Yeah. Where yeah, you're right. I didn't know it was Kelly uh, pertaining to Kelly, but uh, Nelsky's got a part in the recent book about uh, Lindbergh threatening Betty Gao. Right? Is that what you yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah, there's a quote from from the from the Hoffman investigation right. that he he had his officers conduct um, interviewing um, um, the, the former partner who, who had been the partner of Frank Kelly that night and, and mm -hmm. the, in the investigation. And, and I, forget, I forget what the partner's name was, but he had been interrogated and um, he had told in his, the official investigation that Frank Kelly had overheard a conversation between Lindbergh and <laughs> Gao that night where basically um, Lindbergh threatened Gao if she'd yeah. said anything if she said anything he didn't want her to say yeah well i uh, i mean if there's any one thing about that night that drives me crazy that is more convincing than anything and we didn't talk about it maybe some other time but the fact that he withheld opening a ransom note for two hours should tell the police, I mean, why they didn't immediately suspect. Well, they might have made in their minds uh, some excuse for a distraught father who doesn't know which way is up. And uh, meanwhile, he's bossing them around with guns and and they don't get why have you not opened this ransom note and why is the ransom note not in the crib the guy took the baby out of the crib but he put the ransom note so it could blow away on a window so it doesn't but, add up from from the minute they but, get there well but governor the hoffman is, uh thought that and, and he said that in his article that he was uh he found it suspicious that there wasn't opened the envelope and said uh, that? It, governor hoffman in oh. his articles about it in Liberty yeah. Magazine. And Jay yeah. Hoover also said, why wasn't it in the crib? Uh, so those, these issues were raised, but they not, nobody acted on them. And the other yeah. thing that I, that I commented on in my book was how do you explain <clears throat> Lindbergh calling Breckenridge, who's in New York, and saying, come right down, and Breckenridge packs his bag and his wife packs her bag, and they come to stay for a month, <laughs> and all that Lindbergh can tell him is that there's an envelope um, in the room that isn't opened yet. 
Right. Why on earth wouldn't his lawyer advisor say, open the damn envelope so I can know what I'm expecting or why I should come? And it's because both of them knew what was in the envelope. Right. They didn't need it to be opened. Right. The other thing, the other thing is they have crime scene photos from that night. Um, and you have to take yeah. uh, the report's word for it that the note was actually found on the windowsill because the crime scene photos show that it wasn't on the on the windowsill. You don't even see the, the, the ransom note or the envelope in the crime scene photos at all. How did it, so, did they have it? Oh, I'm sorry. So, so if Lindbergh, if Lindbergh was that was acting that cautious about not even touching the ransom note because he didn't want it to disturb evidence, why did he allow or why did he move it or why did he allow somebody else to move it before the photographer got there? I thought it was always in his pocket. I I didn't know where I. You're right. It's not in any of the crime scene photos, but I assumed that he'd put it in his pocket after he showed Betty Gal that it was there. She was the witness. He brought her in. Yeah. We'll get, um, no, I think it went on the mantle. Um, but I think it was. Oh. Uh, I, my recollection is that Harry Wolf said he saw it on the windowsill when he came in. Uh, when Lindbergh brought the police in and told them not to touch it, I think it, it should have likely been still on the windowsill. And they, but I wanted to raise something that you mentioned last time, which somebody had a question about how could Betty Gal and Ann um, open, the shutters. Uh, deal with the shutters. Um, I, I don't think, there is no evidence uh, by the police or anybody questioning Betty Gal about whether that was physically possible. So my assumption has always been that it wasn't hard to do. It was designed to be able to be done. The big question is, why on earth would anybody not question the absence of Betty Gals and Ann's fingerprints on that windowsill? Because there's no way you could reach the shutters without touching the window. Right. And right. they were gone. And the only way they could be gone is if they were erased after the child went missing because they were back at the window um, looking all over the room and doing various things. So the, yeah. the point of the matter is that you, that you could not have erased all fingerprints unless you were in the house after the kidnapping. There were only five people who were in the house after the kidnapping before the police arrived and only one of them was left there by himself for any period of time. And, and that was by his own admission and that was Lindbergh. The mm -hmm. other thing about the crime scene photos, which does not compute at all with Lindbergh's explanation that the reason he didn't, that, that he had said that he had locked the room to, to, prevent, to protect evidence before they even opened the note. He wasn't, he wasn't gonna touch the note because he didn't want to destroy evidence. Uh, he was locking the room because he didn't want to destroy evidence. Or closing um, it. I don't know if he locked or close, it. Or closing it. it. Um, so, so to protect evidence. That, that was his whole explanation. He's preserving evidence. But when you get the crime scene photos of what's supposed to be the evidence, there's no note anywhere that we can see in the room. There's no mud anywhere. They, they said one of the, 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 two, the two indications, apart from there not being any fingerprints anywhere of the three women, um, of there being an intruder are the, are the muddy footprint that they said was on, was on the suitcase. Um, that was the mud that was on the, on the rug, um, and, and the envelope. None of that are there. in the crime scene photos. Yeah. So well, what photo, was he preserved if they're not in the crime the photo, scene photos? I think there is a photo with the mud on the suitcase, but I'm not sure it was the first one. I don't know. Uh, There's I, a I picture the one, yeah. in the evidence file, in the evidence file that it's a it's a color picture. There's a color picture of the suitcase that um, uh, that one of the uh, Falzini's, I think, um, assistant archivists had compiled about the state evidence in the case. That was, I think, the document was drafted in like 2000 something. There, it's a color photograph, so we know it couldn't have been from the 30s mm -hmm. because it's a color photograph. Um, and it looks like it was probably taken in the 90s or 2000s or whatever, but it's a picture of the suitcase, um, a modern picture of a suitcase that has a mud splotch on it, but that mud wasn't in the picture, or wasn't on that suitcase in the crime scene photo, and it's obvious that that mud was not on the crime scene photo, because it's really obvious now that picture that's in the state evidence document, the PDF, it's really obvious you can see a lot of mud there, 
And I asked um, Falzini about it and he said that, um, that the museum um, would flood a lot. And so it, there's, he, he thinks it's very possible that um, a lot of the evidence, including the suitcase was not protected very well and got mud on it much later um, um, after the trial. Um, he thinks it's very likely that that mud that's in that picture from the 2000s PDF was not original. And, and um, I, I think that's probably true because the mud that you can see in the PDF document is not apparent at all um, in well, the crime but scene. There is, I think they, were, they police did uh, say that there was a little bit of mud. That in fact, there was testimony at Houtman's trial that there was a little mud on the floor and there was a little mud on the suitcase. But there's no photographic evidence of it. They didn't take any pictures. I, of I it. understand that, but there was yeah. evidence given that it was seen. Anybody could have smeared yeah. mud on anything they wanted. Yeah. To do. Just well, here's one of the other questions. Betty Gao said that Lindbergh uh, grabbed his gun the very first thing after um, he said they've taken our child. He went to the uh, master bedroom closet, pulled out his rifle, and, and went back in the hall. And meanwhile, she went to get. Uh, Watley, uh, Ollie Watley, the butler chauffeur, um, and uh, uh, Lindbergh and Watley went outside while uh, the women were started searching inside. So it was rainy and muddy and cold. Right. They went outside, they came back. Lindbergh said he made a second visit to the nursery. If Lindbergh made a second visit to the nursery, why is it mud on his, food, uh, on his right. shoes? That right. would be part of what you would find. Exactly. Um, nobody mentions that, that I can see. You're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. But that whole scenario with the, the envelope drives me crazy because what person thinking their son has been taken by they, whoever they are, uh, doesn't open that envelope? I, I just can't imagine. Uh, and what lawyer, what lawyer advisor is going to drive two hours down on a late at night with a packed suitcase uh, because his client says, "Well, uh, there's an envelope here, but I haven't right. opened. It. My son's disappeared." Right. It's like open the envelope. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. The whole thing. Anyway, is I think we have to. Uh, I'm at my end of my time. Yeah. I can assume yeah. for now. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll deal with Jaffsy some other time or yeah. Jaffsy. He's there's so well, many other characters. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. So thank you so much. I just love talking to you. You're so helpful to me and to I'm so glad I've found people that um, that uh, well, first of all, you're helping me. I'm going to write a book eventually, but uh, I just love hearing from you because I'm learning so much and we seem to understand each other. But there are people out there who completely disagree with the three of us, I'm sure. Absolutely. I'm sure that uh, Steve Romeo, I've yet to hear from him. He's a friend of Jim Fisher, wants to talk about something and Calvin Carrega wants to talk about the woods so we'll have plenty of, um, of uh, con uh, controversy which I Absolutely. love. I, I love the controversy but I'm with you guys I I'm crazy about your book it's and everyone has told me that they love it the learning <laughs> oh, that's great. yeah I so we'll we'll meet again I hope and and keep well and safe we want to say anything before you I, I, I'm excited I hope that you know I think it would be very interesting to have like a forum with Caraga with um, people who disagree with our findings of people you know people I, I would like to see what their evidence is um, because I feel like so many people are so um who have studied this are are so set in their theories that they're not open to actually considering, you know, empirical evidence um, because it doesn't compute with what they think the story should be. And I um, I started out not having any particular outcome in mind. What I was trying to do is follow all the evidence and make sense of it. 
Well, you're the judge. You know how to do that. A lot of that's, people don't. That know. was my career, and uh, and that's my bent. I don't like um, opining on anything without having a better understanding of how exactly. I evaluate the evidence. Right. Well, Gregory Algren and Stephen Monier should be um, eventually having a chat with me too, and maybe we can open up the screen. That'd be great. Oh of... yeah, I would. I would love to 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 to, uh, to be in a forum with them. I think yeah. you know. If I've that never was met the... them. I've never. I've oh, spoken wow. with Gregory, but I've never met him. And I stole the title, half the title of their <laughs> book, and I've never met them. But uh, that should be fun. That should be uh, yeah, challenging. Be and... And, and they did amazing work. And that's what got me started on the on the theory that I developed. Me too. Me too. That's... All right. So be well, take care. Me and too. I think we've drained ourselves out for now. And we'll find a new, a new discussion next time. Be well. Bye -bye. Me too. Thank you so Bye, much. Lisa, Thank I you mean... very much for having us. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye.